the boys at. Pilot Boys in the building. Welcome to the Pilot Boys podcast, where you'll get analysis on all things sports, music, and pop culture. I am Mecca Don, and joined by my co-host, Viswant Korapati, a.k.a. V. What it do? This is our first podcast, our very first podcast. And honestly, we started it because we're sick of hearing these quote-unquote experts bullshit, and oftentimes dishonest analysis pervading the airwaves. So instead of complaining about it, we decided to do something about it. And on today's show, we have a very special guest, former Ohio State coach Zach Smith, who will give insight on the Chase Young snitching situation, the NCAA, and, of course, the new college football rankings. Don't say. <laughs> Some of you may know me as a music artist or a lawyer. Others may know me as that nonstop Ohio State guy on Twitter. Either way, I'm here to give you the real on all topics. V has his MBA from Case Western, his undergrad business degree from Fisher at The Ohio State University, and is an expert in marketing, branding, and business. Additionally, he's an avid sports and music enthusiast and insider. What's up, V? What's up? This show will mix elements of seriousness with humor, music and sports analysis, special guests, and straight up smack talk. We don't respect dummies on this show. No dummies allowed. And we're bound to expose all of them. This is actually a perfect segue. On our full shows, we'll have multiple segments. One of them will be called The Segment, and we'll focus on all things Ohio State. Another will be called Exposing the Farce, which will actually expose a lot of different entities and situations that we see in pop culture. An example will be the NCAA. Today's show is just a preview show, so we'll start with a combination of these. But before we start, do us a favor. Follow us at at Pilot Boys Pod on Twitter and Pilot Boys Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. Let me start, let me start by telling you guys a story. When I was about 10, 11, or 12, maybe somewhere around that age, I used to do these local TV commercials for a brand called Schottensteins in Value City. And if you're from the Columbus or Central Ohio area, I'm sure you've heard of these brands. So it was, you know, quick commercials for clothing, stuff like that. Nothing big, but it was fun, fun thing that I did. Those are my, my Zoolander days. I'll post them on Instagram sometimes. So. <laughs> Please, I hope those, those, those don't surface anywhere. But why is that relevant? When I was a senior in high school, first year playing football, I actually got recruited. We had a very good team. We won the state championship, St. Francis de Sales. Shout out to Stallion Pride. And we had a lot of players that were going D1. And as a result of that, we had a lot of scouts that used to come to our games. Not for me, but for the other players. And as a, and I got, the, you know, I got the benefit of that. So I had offers to play at small schools, Ivy League schools, small Mac schools. And then I also got what was called a preferred walk-on offer to play at Ohio State. And I had a full-ride academic scholarship. So growing up a Buckeyes fan, obviously that was a no-brainer for me. So I decided, obviously, I was going to Ohio State. One of the first things that happened when I got to Ohio State is we had a meeting, and it was a NCAA compliance meeting. I had no idea what any of this shit was about. I didn't even know anything about NCAA, really, like what it meant or anything. But we had a meeting. And in that meeting, they gave us a form. And the form we had to fill out, we had to say whether or not we had ever been paid for our likeness or had ever done any kind of commercial activity or any, anything in our life. So I remember I went up to the guy and I said, listen, when I was like 10, I did these commercials for Schottensteins in Value City. Is this something that I need to include? He said, oh, yeah, you definitely need to include that. It's like, all right, that was like eight years ago, but whatever. So I included it. And it turns out that I was no longer allowed to do those commercials anymore, even though I hadn't done them for a long time, because I wasn't necessarily allowed to be paid for my likeness anymore. And now Ohio State, well, I guess the NCAA kind of owned my likeness. That was kind of my first introduction to the NCAA. It didn't bother me so much at the time because I hadn't really done it anymore. It wasn't something that I was passionate about. But when I look back on it, I was like, man, fuck you. You don't, you don't own me. You don't own my likeness. You can't control what it is that I do and don't do with things that have nothing to even do with Ohio State. 
That's about the most anti-capitalist thing to do is to take away someone's right to make money off of their own name and their own likeness. Yeah, and they get away with it. And that, and that is you know, a perfect segue into the kind of the Chase Young situation, which I wanted to talk about, V. And, and V, I guess we'll start here with you. What, when you first heard about the Chase Young situation, what was the kind of first thing that popped in your head? What, was, what were your first thoughts on it? Well, I think people start taking shots once they, they see that something's happening. Um, mainly Ohio State's playing really well. Chase Young is dominating. Um, so the attention is there. And in college athletics specifically, there are so many ways to take someone down. Mm -hmm. um, so I would like to say I was surprised. I wasn't surprised. It's just when someone's dominating like that, you know behind the scenes that people are trying to take take a program down, take a player down, or undermine them in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, and so the thing for me was I was like, wait, so – let me get this story straight because, you know, the story came out with the details were a little bit sketchy at first. And obviously, you know, I always have to say this, right, is that I reserve the right to change my mind on my analysis if new information comes out, so <laughs> on and so forth. Bullshit, right? Okay, I have to say that, right? <laughs> but from what we know now, it appears that Chase Young took a loan from someone that he knew to buy his girlfriend a ticket to go see him play in the Rose Bowl, where so many different people were making money off of that Rose Bowl from... Coaches to administrators, bonuses to, to sponsorships to TV revenue, and he wasn't allowed to make money. Probably the biggest star in that whole situation, and now he's borrowing money to have his girlfriend come watch him play in that game, and now he's going to be punished as, as and a he result. paid it back. And he paid it back. First of all, let me talk about that too, real quick. I know people keep bringing that up that he paid it back, and I guess that is an important de detail. But to me, I'm like, why the fuck does it matter if he paid it back or he didn't? If it's a loan from a family friend, then who cares if he paid it back? How many mm -hmm. times? I mean, I borrowed money from <laughs> my dad. I probably owe him $60,000. I mean, shit, who yeah. cares? Who cares if he paid it back? But for the sake of the completeness of the story, he did pay it back. So now he borrowed money to have his girlfriend come watch him play in a Rose Bowl where everybody around him is making money off of. He's not allowed to. He paid the money back, and now not only is it that he's suspended indefinitely, because at this point in time we don't know what's going on, but now his name is being dragged through the mud. And that's the thing that's the saddest thing about this whole thing to me is that people are talking about him. They hear the headlines. People stop reading. They don't, they're not going to follow up and hear about the story. Now it's, oh, Chase Young took money from the agent. I've seen that so many fucking times on Twitter. And because of the landscape of college football, Ohio State is forced to take action before – judgment has been made we don't know what the ncaa is saying but ohio state's basically suspended him as a precautionary measure knowing that he is going to get suspended at some point so he's not even getting due process in this situation before he faces consequences again that's something that's pretty un-american yeah and the thing is is this the reality of it is, is you know the story i started with was kind of a likeness question this isn't even really a likeness issue at all um it's just a guy who borrowed money from someone that he knew you know that's the the average day-to-day -day story in anywhere in the world not even just here um but the reason why the likeness is relevant is because a guy who's that popular who has created a huge name for himself has a likeness that many people use and benefit from he is not allowed to make money off of that and if he was he would never have had to be in the situation to begin with how much money could he have possibly borrowed? It couldn't have been that a significant sum of money. If he was making even close, even a 10% of what his market value was, he would have had plenty of money that he wouldn't have had to borrow from anybody. I mean, why couldn't the NCAA or the bowl game just charter some jets for families and friends of players to go out to the game with the millions of dollars that they're making? There's and, simple solutions to these these issues that aren't that aren't happening. For sure. And so, you know, with the rule changes with, with the likeness and stuff like that coming up, we, you know, we'll get into that more later, probably in a different show. But it does bring me one question that I do want people to think about, which is what happens to the guys who are never allowed to make a dollar, right? So you have all of these guys that have come through that have made huge names for obviously themselves, but also for their university who never – we're able to make it on the next level, right? Because that's the argument people make. Well, they have the opportunity to go to the NFL. But a lot of these guys don't make it. No. But that doesn't mean that they didn't have huge, tremendous value while they were playing in college. And now, 
what happens to them? It's kind of like the the marijuana legalization thing, right? Now marijuana is legal and everything's cool and all these people are making money off it. But what happened to all the people who are in jail or all the people who lost their livelihood or all the people whose names were besmirched or they lost their jobs? What happened to all those people when they were getting caught, so to speak, marijuana? It's the same type of thing. Like what happens to all these guys now? They have to watch all of this, all of these people make money and they can't get that time back. So that's one thing about the NCAA. We'll definitely, <laughs> we'll probably get into that <laughs> a lot on this show. But um, it's something that I re- really want people to think about. You know, when people are always talking about, oh, well, these guys, they have this and they have that. No, they don't. Okay. Mm-hmm. They don't. It is, like V said earlier, the most un American system in the United States. And they're allowed to get away with it time and time again. Today, we actually have a guest on the show. Our guest is a former Ohio State football coach and now a podcast extraordinaire. You can hear his podcast, Menace to Society, everywhere. He's also a very informative social media follow, and he gives the real. And one of, these, one of the things that's going to be very prevalent on this show is you are going to hear real talk. We are not going to sit here and bullshit you. We're not going to give you the fake political spin. We are going to tell you the real. When we get back from this break, we will be here sitting here with Zach Smith. And you guys don't want to miss that. Stay tuned. Politics as usual. Took my Frito to Tito in the district. Bless me with some BS, somethings I could live with. Stop fronting and for the dough I raise. Gotta get shit appraised. No disrespect to you. Make sure your word is true. I'm taking wages down in Vegas. Welcome back to the Pilot Boys podcast. Again, I'm Mecca Don. I'm here with V. Yo, yo. We have a very special guest in the house. <laughs> very special guest. The man, the myth, the legend. Zach Smith in the building. Give it up for Zach Smith. <laughs> well, I appreciate you having me on, man. First podcast. This is uh, uh, this is the inaugural uh, episode, huh? That's it. It's the yeah. first one, man. Ooh, the very want... first one. It's crazy because, you know, we've been talking about doing it for a long time and uh, just never got around to it. But logistically, it's, it's working out right now. And um, first of all, we are very thankful and blessed to have you as a first guest. Uh, we listen to your podcast. Your podcast is amazing, man. It's the Society. Everybody definitely check that out. Um, but let's jump right into it, man. Who snitched on who snitched on Chase Young? <laughs> no warm up. <laughs> yeah, no warm up. <laughs> no warm up. Right to it. Nothing. No, huh? Right to it. Um, it. So the biggest thing I, I did my research mainly because, and here's why I even cared to get into it. One, it's obviously one of the most nationally relevant stories sure. right now. But also, they were making some pretty big accusations amongst Ohio State fan base on on the kids' high school coach, who's the running back coach at Maryland, mm-hmm. on Maryland in general, Mike Loxley, who I know really well. Yeah. So I was like, first of all, I know Mike Loxley. He is living in a glass house himself. Mm-hmm. He surely is not throwing no stones at nobody. Right. I've recruited against him. Mm-hmm. I've been on the road with him. There's no way. So I start looking into it. Everyone in the state of Maryland, high school coaches, you name it, is like, Lox? No, no, no. That's not who did it. Right. And then they start saying, we don't know, you know, we don't know how he did it, but everyone in Maryland on ground zero, high school level, like in the communities, they all think James Franklin is the snitch. Wow. And so I'm sitting here like, wow. I know both of them. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense than Mike Loxley. Yeah. <laughs> and so yeah. what I, I put out on the episode yesterday was that uh, it wasn't necessarily that James Franklin was the snitch. Mm-hmm. It was more that it's not Maryland. You don't know what you're talking about. And if we want to go based off rumors, because that's how everyone's going right now, yeah. the rumors are that it's James Franklin. Right. So let's chill out on Maryland right now. Right, right. So right. I don't know if it was really James Franklin. I'd imagine if it was even him, he he didn't pick somebody up the phone and call. The yeah, he didn't pick up the phone and call. Yeah. He had he, he had somebody report it, whatever. But it makes more sense, too. <laughs> right. Yeah, no. That, well, James is a, a guy that I, you know, I've had some interaction with. Mm-hmm. And he he has some charm and appeal about him, right? I mean, I oh, think yeah. like you know, but I know that he's also really jealous of Ohio State. You know? and, and he's 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 waiting to do you know one real thing at Penn State right now, which is win a championship, make the playoffs, right? Yeah. And he feels like you know two weeks ago, this is my shot, mm-hmm. and 
they got a they got a pretty dominant player over there. Oh, and I heard this rumor because he, you know, he had two stints at Maryland. He coached at Maryland for like eight years total. Yeah. So he knows a lot of people in the area. He probably caught wind of whatever this loan was and was like, ah, this is a little. Did t- he recruit Chase Young? Uh, this is, I'm sure I don't, he did. Uh, he tried to, I mean, he probably tried to. Yeah. I, I, Chase, I, I think, was really focused on the big time programs, you know, nationally, the Ohio State's, Alabama's, Clemson's. Yeah. But um, maybe the Minnesota loss was karma then. Well, that's. That's what I said. It's like, wow. Like yeah. you, if that re- if that's real, and he's the one that started this whole thing, he should have focused on Minnesota and not Chase Young. Right, right, right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he bit him in the ass. That's exactly, for sure. Exactly. So V, I know you had a question about uh, snitching in general. That you wanted to ask Zach. Um, why do you think the snitching is so pervasive in college football, and, and what's at stake here? Like, why does it? Obviously, people snitch because there are consequences for snitching. Um, and also potential um, results from snitching. Why do you think it is so pervasive right now? Um, I think I think it's really uh, jealousy. I think that a lot of these programs. Here, here's the thing: no program squeaky clean. I did it for 15 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw programs that are way worse than others. But ultimately, and Loxley and I actually had a conversation about it. He's like, "Why would I turn someone else in? Even if they're doing some outlandish things, one, they're going to get caught anyways. Right. Two. I don't need people thinking I'm a snitch because then let me like say hello to a kid when I'm not supposed to. Boom, I'm I'm turned in. Right. right. You don't you don't want that reputation yeah. amongst other coaches. Plus, you might coach with the guy one day. Right. You want to snitch on him and then have to go walk in a staff room with right, him. Right. Right. Not true. me. Right. So um, I, it's it's dangerous to do. I've been around coaches that did it. Ed Warner did it uh, to Florida once, and, and it was a friend of mine and a friend of Urban's. And Urban didn't really know what was going on, and it was like one of those like, "What are you doing? No, no we don't do that." Right. And so it's uh. But I think it's it's especially in a in a if you want to call it a rivalry, but a Penn State Ohio State matchup where Penn State certainly has been second fiddle to Ohio State on the field overall in recruiting for sure, and it's like God that thirst to just beat them right. to win. <laughs> so I guess what so that brings me to another point. Like, well, what is at stake? Like, let's get into it a little bit deeper. What really is at stake? What is it the difference between getting Chase a Chase Young, for example, at Ohio State versus not getting him? For a program, right? What is that? What are the ramifications of that? I mean, beyond, besides the obvious, right? Right. Uh, it's, I mean, it's so deep. Uh, and I just go back to my time at Ohio State, starting in 2012, and I've I've mentioned this a number of times on air. In 2012, as good as Ohio State was before Urban came in, it was not a sexy place for like the number one receiver in the country. Mm. It was, I mean, it was regionally in the Midwest, really strong. Mm -hmm. You could go toe to toe with anyone, Mm -hmm. but you try to go to South Florida and pull a receiver over Alabama, like good luck. Right. And so what, what it took was a kind of, I mean, it was, we could talk forever about it, but I think a lot of things help. And we started doing some personal branding, some unit branding, some things to make it more appealing. And then, um, then you land one big player. And all of a sudden, especially in an area, mm. like that's what happened to me. We we went down to I went to Virginia Beach and got Jalen Holmes. Went down to South Florida, got Johnny Dixon. It doesn't matter how, what impact you think they had on the field. They both had great impact, but maybe they weren't first round picks. Right. They were Jalen was close, mm-hmm. but the the ramifications of getting that one player in that area is unbelievable. Yeah. You go down to South Florida, they're like, how's Johnny Dixon doing? And wow. all of a sudden it's like, boom, branding done. They know a guy that they played seven on seven with that was a baller that went up there. Now instantly there's a connection. Yeah. So you get a guy from Chase Young, like Chase Young out of the, the Catholic league in Maryland, which is the only, the best football in Maryland. And everyone watches him just dominate everywhere. You go back to any of those Catholic schools, they're going to be like, Oh, Chase Young. That's yeah. my, it changes the whole you know, dynamic. You know, Wale, the rapper, right? He, yeah. he's, he's a huge Chase Young fan. Right. Wale's from Maryland. Right. He follows him and he tweets about him every week. Like that's I look at that. I'm like, so and I interact with Wale sometimes on yeah. Saturdays about it too. I'm like, that's huge branding for Ohio State. Like, like whoa, like that's it's, crazy. It, it's transcendent. Yeah. And it, it's no different than with Paris Campbell. And I, granted, that's more of a pipeline, Akron State Vincent St. Mary's, but all of a sudden, LeBron James is tweeting about Paris every game because yeah. he knows that that's little bro. That right. he went to St. V just like me. Yeah. Like and it's like, what does that do in the Akron area? Uh more than anything you could do in recruiting. LeBron James yeah. tweeting about an Ohio State player does more than any coach talking to a kid for six months. Right. So specifically, like a guy at the level of a Chase Young, um, when he comes down to the wire, he's probably got every school in the country giving him an offer. He could go to Alabama. He could go to Ohio State. Can you give us some insight and just like in the final hour and crunch time, how competitive it gets um, between schools and some of the things that, that happen there? Yeah, I mean, you talk about a, a kid like a Chase Young. 
that that you're talking about you're recruiting against the big boys <laughs> you're and there is a definite difference when you're recruiting that uh generational talent compared to just a really good player it just feels different i remember we went down and uh it was let me think american heritage high school had three or four players that were just ridiculous pat certain starts at alabama um tyson campbell starts at georgia nesta starts at miami i mean they and they are difference makers and we went down there and it was not your normal recruiting trip it was four deep like alabama and us are there and it's i mean the kids are going to show up at 11 o'clock and it was like if you've ever been to like it's, it's what i'd imagine the stock market is like where you're like all right how do i intercept these kids to get them with urban before alabama intercepts them and gets them with saban and you got to mm. start being creative like you better have like that third coach that's in the car like bro listen i need you to walk to the right of the building mm. so i can grab them and he'll be like all right i got you well now you better spend a lot of time with that specific assistant coach because alabama's probably doing it to the other assistant coach right. it's just, it's wild wild west yeah of a of that caliber of a player where if it's just a really good player, I mean, it's still a recruiting battle, but it's not like cutthroat like that. And so yeah. chase young, as you get down the wire at the end, what really matters is the relationship you built because they're getting everything thrown at them. Probably boosters coming at them, girls coming at them, everyone in the world, pl players coming at them at some point before they have to sign and move wherever they're going to sit down and go, I really want to play for Larry Johnson mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Like, He's real. He's always been real. I feel like he's the most authentic. I want to go play for him. Right. So the real shows up. Yeah. But when a player like Chase, it may take a while to get there. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you've got to filter through so much bullshit. So how do you think this this Chase situation ends up? I mean, you know, I know he obviously didn't play last week. There are rumors he'll be suspended up to four games. Some people are saying two games. What do you think the ultimate fallout of this situation is going believe, to be? Believe it or not, you all were recording, and I was on Twitter, and they just announced that he's two games. Oh, wow. So okay. I have gr uh, great insight okay. <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't have. Yeah, thank you all. But, but it's, breaking uh, news. Right, yeah. breaking yeah. news. It's a two-game suspension, so he'll okay. be back for Penn State, which okay. I, I hope that my sources are right, and it was James Franklin, because you talk about – pissing a kid oh off gosh, he's yeah. coming back for the game against you yeah and he's not happy <laughs> right so do you think that um i don't know if you saw the actual details of it is that is that something that ohio state will appeal or is it are they just gonna you think they'll accept the two games and move on they're accepting and moving on okay i mean especially considering the opponent if right. penn state was this weekend they might yeah. try to fight it i right. doubt they could even get a response back before saturday right. anyways so right. i think they're just gonna Take it, take it for what it's worth. Move on and go try to chase this championship. And do you think that there'll be any lasting impact on Chase's reputation or anything like that, or do you think no. it's something that he can? I mean, I, I, I mean, you look at even guys like Chris Carter, who who really committed a violation back in their time. Mm -hmm. I mean, he he took legit money from an agent, got kicked out of college football, had to go in the supplemental draft. Right. He comes back to Columbus and is. I mean, he's like the, the son of Columbus, the yeah. son, son of Buckeye Nation. Right. So ultimately, in the end, it won't. Yeah. Uh, the only sad part is, is there's records that could have been broken that, and not Heisman. the uh, Heisman yeah. campaign. There, there's there's bigger uh, ramifications answer. because of this yeah. that people will forget about. That right. Chase Young probably could have won the Heisman first time really ever that a true defensive player was in the mix right. that heavily. Yeah. And that's pretty much over now. Yeah. I've got one last question on this thing because the specific violation seems to be related to him having his girlfriend come and watch him play. Can you give us some insight on how that works? Like family tickets? Like it seems like this is something that doesn't make sense. Yeah, like, you've talked be... about on Twitter an opportunity fund or something yeah. like that too. So maybe – so, so the NCAA has an opportunity fund, and, and there's very, very few schools that use it to help players with travel to games for family and things like that just because it, it's really expensive. Mm. Not that they don't have the money. It just would be expensive. But there are teams that do it. They sell it in recruiting, specifically Southern teams. And Ohio State, we, we, we discussed it at length because we knew Alabama was, was selling it. We knew these other schools are selling it. And it's like, ultimately, if a kid's like, man, my mom can come to all the away games at Alabama and not at Ohio State – I'm probably going to go to Alabama because mm -hmm. I love my mom. Right. And so my so literally whole, the kid just goes in and says, hey, can I and re makes a request for a certain amount of money to have their family? Is that that's what, it. Is that's how it works. And, uh, and Ohio State has it right now. They use it for for and they don't they they don't abuse it. OK. Like it's like, oh, Austin Mack uh, maybe needs some clothes. OK, we'll approve five hundred dollars to help you out because you don't have any money and you need to get some winter clothes mm. and they'll do it. And ultimately they're paying the players like right. that's what blows my mind about this whole conversation. Mm. Like. Well, should we p pay the players, or how how would that work? And I'm like, they already have it. Right. They already can. Right now, today, they could cut everyone a check, right. and and it, it can't be excessive. And there's yeah. definitely tax implications. Sure. 
but it already goes on. Right. And that's why this whole thing with Chase Young is like, all right, never mind when he met the guy. Is he a friend? Is he a family friend? This, that, and the other. Like, they had to fly to California. He wanted his girlfriend to go. Ultimately, Ohio State's going to make, I don't know, what, $50 million off of that game? Right. Just cut every, cut all, cut all the players a check Thank for you. two grand to Thank fly you. them out there. Thank like, you. fly Why their family. Or just charter a plane. Like, I know you were a coach. Uh, yeah. When you guys go down the bowl game, you're, you're, Families fly down on a, a chartered plane. It's so it's so ridiculous because you're absolutely right. And you and if you ever been on one of those planes, you are on there like this is ridiculous. I mean, yeah. every assistant athletic director, assistant ticket salesperson, and their husband and their wife. Unbelievable. And I mean, like coaches will fly out, uh, babysitters, and you're sitting here like unbelievable. But Dwayne Haskins' mom can't fly out, right? But but Zach Smith's babysitter can, yeah. But Dwayne Haskins' mom can't. One, one of the parents actually told us that they actually have to pay for it up front. Yeah, and that's then true. get reimbursed. So you're talking about the college football playoff, two games during the holiday season. That if you want to fly your family out, most working class families don't have an extra five grand, five grand laying around. And but you're, I mean, and you're leaving out the Big Ten championship. What right. kid's not going to go to the Big Ten? Yeah. What parent is not going to go to the Big Ten championship if their kids play right. now in, in literally thirty days? If you're not living in Indianapolis or one of these bowl game cities, you're yeah. taking three cross country trips, like, and then you have people trying to expand the playoffs, right, and then make it even more games. That more games, and they're not when they're talking about that, they're not talking about expanding the money that's that's available for these kids too. All right, I, I know we could talk about this forever, <laughs> so I, I want to move a little bit to um, to the CFP rankings that just yeah. came out last night. You know, my initial thoughts. You know, I put it out on Twitter. I feel like there's a you know. The Big Ten is still suffering from a perception bias. That's a fact. I think uh, the SEC is still getting slurped like the way they always get slurped. Always. And um, so I actually wanted to focus in really – I wanted to get your thoughts on the rankings, but specifically let's focus in on like number four through number eight. Mm -hmm. I think four was Georgia, yep. five Alabama, yep. six was Oregon, mm -hmm. seven Utah, and eight Minnesota. And I just want to get your thoughts on, on that positioning – um, why do you think that happened? Do you think it's fair? Do you think it should be changed? Um, so, so I pred on yesterday's show, I predicted Georgia would be four, and yeah. and though I completely disagree with them being four, I will tell you this: uh, I'm not saying they got it right, but Georgia's the best complete team in the SEC after LSU because they're the only team in the SEC out of those three that play defense. Mm. And do they, they deserve do to be four? Absolutely not. They lost to. The, they have the worst loss in the top ten, mm -hmm. so they don't deserve to be there. And right. to be honest, nor does Alabama. Yeah. The best, the team that deserves to be there right now is Oregon. Mm -hmm. if, if we're talking quality of loss, right. Oregon has one loss, first game of the year, neutral site, mm -hmm. last play of the game to a ranked Auburn team. Right. Like, what more could you want? Right. right. And, and further to the point, who has a who has a a better loss than Penn State right now? Mm -hmm. Penn State lost to an undefeated team. Yeah. Right. That's true. And, and and that's, I guess, Alabama's argument. So right. what you don't know is what the committee is valuing here. Yeah. Like, is it quality wins? Okay, then why why would Clemson be above Minnesota? Right. Both think, teams are undefeated. Minnesota beat a top 10 team. Yep. Clemson has not. Yep. And I think that's the biggest issue here is that none of us know exactly how they come to these conclusions. But I'm going to be honest right? with you. I don't think they know they don't how know. they come to the – They don't, they don't know. It's literally like, I, I think Georgia deserves to be in. Why? Well – they have a great defense. Okay, then what's the next one? Uh, well, Clemson deserves to be in. Why? They're on, you know they have everyone's different. It's like wow, but they lost to South Carolina. Yeah. They, they, they one conversation they talk about the loss. One t conversation they talk about a win. Yeah. The next yeah. conversation is I just test. the eye test. Right. It's like they don't have any criteria really. So I think so. I I do think it's somewhat fair for programs to get. I don't want to say. I guess for lack of a better word, benefit of the doubt based on things that they've done recently and in mm -hmm. the past, and who their coaches are, and so on, and, and the recruits and the talent. I do think there is something to that, mm -hmm. but I think that Al teams like Alabama, for example, they get it too much, right? They haven't the played SEC anybody. in general. The SEC in general, they haven't played anybody. Um, the, the first time they did play somebody, they lost, and people say, "Oh, it was a close game." LSU was kind of controlling that game for most of the game. LSU made a good, or Alabama made a little comeback, but that was LSU's game. And they're still being ranked in the number five. I guess what people are telling me is like, listen, don't worry about that number five, Alabama, because all these other teams have better opportunities to kind of come up. And Minnesota, if they go undefeated, they'll get in. And Oregon, if they win the Pac-12 and go undefeated, they'll get in. And Baylor, I don't even know where Baylor is ranked, honestly. Baylor's undefeated, right? In the big I think they were so, 12 so or something. That, that, that honestly, that little five-team ranking is the most uh, definitive – 
ranking of uh, uh, to show SEC bias. So, so undefeated Baylor is directly behind Florida and Auburn. Yeah, two lost teams. That's crazy. That are in the SEC, That's and they're crazy. directly in front of Wisconsin and Michigan. Two lost teams from the Big Ten. So what they just said right there was Baylor's undefeated. Well, they're certainly better than the two lost Big Ten teams, but not the two lost SEC teams. And it's like, and what is that based on? That's the thing that just drives me insane. It drives you nuts. It. So here's the thing, people, and, and this is, I guess, kind of my my final spin on this is that, or final take on this is that people are saying to me, "Oh, don't worry, it'll all play itself out. If if Minnesota goes undefeated, they'll get in. If Ohio State goes undefeated, they'll get in. Blah 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 blah. Don't worry about it." And I'm like. That is probably technically true, but that's not really the point. And this is maybe something that you could touch on. The perception matters still, right? The perception of rankings. Don't Every coach looks at rankings. I don't give a fuck what people want to tell that's me. All, absolutely. You have to look at rankings, you have right? To. It's part of your recruiting. It's part of just how you analyze how the, the, the country is seeing you. And so there are other ramifications of these rankings beyond just, oh, if, you know, things will take care of themselves, or if you win out, you'll get in. It's not just about getting in also. It's also about kind of the perception, right? I mean, look at Minnesota. Like, they're building a program here. They have a new coach that's trying to recruit. They're undefeated. They beat the committee's number four team last week, Mm -hmm. and they're ranked below Utah and Oregon and two SEC teams. Right. Three SEC teams, right? Yeah, Yeah, three. Like, how do you how do you get a win? Like, they're trying... trying And like you said earlier, they're also behind Utah... And Oregon, who have both lost already. Minnesota yeah. hasn't lost. And the committee told us that Penn State was number four. We didn't tell you that. Yeah. You guys told us that. And Minnesota went and beat them. That's the best win, maybe outside of LSU's win. That's probably the best win in the top oh, ten. It definitely is. So how does it so so just give us a little bit of insight on how how did the rankings actually affect coaching, recruiting, brand, all that type of stuff? Perception. Well, it, I don't think it it, it is gonna affect it's not going to affect LSU at all. It's not going to affect Clemson at all. It's not going to affect Ohio State at all. Mm-hmm. They just need to handle business. Right. Simple as that. It's that next tier. Mm-hmm. And you saw it in 2014 with us at Ohio State. And you're going to see it right now with Oregon or Utah. They need to make some statements now to, to, to get the committee to put them up there. And you saw it when we, in 2014. We had to go out and hang 59 nothing on Wisconsin or right. we were not getting in. No. And, who, and who ends up winning it all? Yeah. We did. Right, exactly. <laughs> and so it's like it, you're going to see a, a lot happen with that. Uh, four through eight range. Yeah. Where, and especially as it plays out and maybe Georgia loses the SEC championship game and then it's like, all right, well, let's say Oregon beats Utah. How right. bad did they beat them? Yeah. Did they beat them by 20? Mm-hmm. They're probably in. Right. Did they win by three? Yeah. They're probably out. Yeah. And so it changes really your whole perspective once you're kind of in there saying, all right, if we are in the position to win the Pac-12, that's our first goal. Mm-hmm. But if we're, you know, right there, we're up by three, we yeah. got to start making it happen to, to win by 15 right. or whatever. That's yeah. Just, it, so let's talk about that a little bit. So let's talk about let's actually talk about, you know, I know it's a little premature, but let's talk about the final four CFP rankings and what it actually means from like again, recruiting, from brand, from money. There's a lot of money that comes in if you get oh. in that final four. There's a huge difference between being ranked fourth and being ranked fifth at the end. Talk a little bit about that. What is it, the impact of actually being in the CFP? Yeah, I mean, it's the, well, the impact. I, I, I don't have a financial value on a university, but in one of my shows I did this, and this is crazy to think about. If you think about 2015, right, which was when we lost in the rain to Michigan State, didn't make the playoffs, probably with the best team in the country. Mm-hmm. But there was one play in the Michigan game, Michigan-Michigan State, where the punter dropped the ball, Michigan State recovered it, last play of the game, scored a touchdown. All Michigan had to do was punt the ball away, they win. They win. Because of that, Michigan State not losing that game, we didn't go to the Big Ten Championship. They did. And because we didn't go to the Big Ten Championship, we didn't make the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And the ramifications just on coaching bonuses was like $1.3 million. Crazy. That one play. The punter catches the ball and punts it. Us as Ohio State coaches get $1.3 million. Unbelievable. He drops the ball, $1.3 million gone. And mm. so you just just magnify that. Yeah, I mean, I, for that, sure. If if the coaches are getting one point three, yeah. the university's getting fifty. Right. And so right. it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And that's what I was trying to explain a little bit on Twitter to people is it's not just that things can take care of themselves, but these rankings ultimately affect a lot of different things. Obviously, financially, like you said, but even recruiting, even visibility for the program, perception of the program, getting your your because for at the end of the day, we might have LSU one LSU undefeated. Clemson undefeated, Ohio State undefeated, Minnesota one loss, Oregon one loss. Um, then we're gonna have Oklahoma could e- could have one loss, Baylor could have one loss, mm-hmm. right? If they, I don't know if they meet in the championship or on the same side of the division, but no, they, you they, could have like 
all these did I say Alabama one loss already? Yeah, Alabama. Six, seven, eight teams that are gonna have a real legitimate argument. People try to say, Oh, that's the reason why we should have an eighteen playoff. I don't agree. But the difference between who gets in and doesn't, you just articulated one of the, a, a huge difference. I mean, that's that matters. So I think I don't know. People who have a voice need to fight against this shit, you know, because <laughs> it really does have impact. Um and, and the, what really the, the scary part is just the 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 biases by conference and who drives those biases. So you're you're really allowing these ESPN fig, figureheads to drive public opinion, to drive all this stuff, and it you see results in the AP polls, and, and all of a sudden it's like who's driving the sport? Is it a committee that's making a decision based on what they see on the field, right? Or is ESPN driving it by promoting rankings and teams, and now it's like some president in Bristol, Connecticut that's really running college football. And, yeah. and if you look at it, the SEC network, I think, is an entity of ESPN, right? Yeah, oh yeah. They own so it. why wouldn't they be biased, right? There's a lot of money at stake, and that's kind of the underbelly that people don't want to talk about. Yeah. There's a lot of money at stake behind this. A the lot scenes. of money at stake. These network deals, these advertising deals, there's a lot of money at stake. So anyway... We want to thank Zach Smith. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate you having me. No, no, it's awesome, man. This is our first show. Uh, we couldn't couldn't have had a better guest to shed some light on some of these issues. Uh, make sure everybody checks out his podcast, Menace to Society. What's the website? Tell us the website. Web- website's Menace to Society Podcast.com. You can find it by searching my name, by searching Menace to Society, Menace to Sports. You can find it, out, and it's on every platform. Okay. So it's been fun, man. I'm excited for you guys to get started on your journey. Oh, thanks, man. No, I appreciate it. And, uh, so, yeah, we'll definitely be in touch. I'm sure this won't be our last time where we collaborate on podcasts. And um, definitely, you guys, thank you for tuning in. Definitely uh, stay tuned to uh, Pilot Boys Pod on Twitter, uh, Pilot Boys Podcast on Instagram and Facebook. We'll be right back with some final thoughts. I'm a small time, I said it. I'm addressing all drama. Talk to me. Welcome back to the Pilot Boys podcast. We are here with some final thoughts before we sign off. Um, earlier in the show, we were talking a lot about the Chase Young situation, NCAA, college football rankings, perception, and business. And uh, as I was telling you guys earlier on the show, V is actually an expert in business and branding, marketing. And I wanted to get his thoughts uh, on kind of the NCAA, uh, college football, college sports in general, how it's been running. And how it's different, or at least how they've tried to carve out a difference between them and that business versus the way every other business seems to run in this country. And V, I just wanted you to kind of chime in. Tell us kind of your thoughts on that and, and where you think that uh, the direction of this thing can go, especially now that the NCAA is getting pressure. They've kind of changed the likeness thing, or at least they're trying to. Where do you think this thing is going to end up? And what things do you think can be fixed about it? I think if you look at the the history of the country, right, in every industry, um, before change happens legally, well, there's always a period of time where people are exploiting an industry. Mm-hmm. Um, the NCAA is essentially exploiting the fact that they have a monopoly and don't have to pay their labor right now. Um, they're not going to give that up quickly because no business, that's capitalism, you fight for every dollar. And they're not going to give that up easily. Um, but these players who have the least resources are going to have to step up and and figure out a way to challenge the NCAA as they've started to do with some of this image and likeness likeness stuff. But it just doesn't make sense in America for you to go and work and not make money. Going and playing football is not not work, right? These guys have to clock in. They have to go to practice. They have to work on the field. And so to say, hey, they're just amateurs and we're giving them a college scholarship, that doesn't equate the value that these guys are delivering. And so that's why there has to be a change. And the change is only going to happen as these guys continue to figure out how to fight for themselves and win these battles. So what are, what are some of the, just, just real quick, what are some of the type of fights that could work? Is it a boycott? Is it a player stage and say, you know, we're not playing this game. Fuck that. We're not playing this game. Just one game. Could that have the type of impact that you're talking about or – do you think it has to be something bigger and wholesale or even legal for I mean, it to change? I mean, I think a, a big game on a big stage, like a college football playoff game, if the players on both sides said, we're not playing this game. That'd be crazy. 
I would love to see that shit. Unless there's some change. Yeah. It's like these people, like you have to sometimes stand up and call their bluff, yeah. right? The NCAA is not going to walk away from the billion dollars in money that they're making from the college football playoff. But sometimes these players, they just need, they're 18, 19, 20-year-old kids. Mm-hmm. They don't know the power that they have. Right. But if they were willing to do that, like what Ed O'Bannon did to fight the NCAA, mm-hmm. those are the type of things that you have to be willing to do yeah. and not be scared to do. But the problem is that there's no one around these kids telling them, hey, this is what your guy's worth is. Right. So I think my final thought on that is I don't want to place the entire burden. And I'm not saying you're doing this, but I don't want to place the entire burden on the kids. Because like I said, in my the story that I told when I first got to Ohio State, I didn't know about the NCAA and likeness. I, I, I wasn't aware of that. And I, you know, I was a smart kid. It wasn't until later that I actually started to realize and understand what all of that meant what values were. And I was a walk on. I'm not saying I'm Chase Young, but I'm just saying that I started to understand it later. And so I think it's unfair for us to place the va- uh, place the burden on these young kids to fight these battles. When these kids just want to play football, they want to enjoy it. I think it's up to the adults, just like it is in a lot of other situations. It's up to the adults that know to protect these kids. And they're not even necessarily kids. We call them kids, but the, you, you, you send this same kids so to speak to war to go fight and kill people and potentially be killed but then they're kids when it comes to this we call it the whole thing amateurism but then the coach is making money like a ceo at a fortune 500 company and not like a professor why is not if it's amateurism then the coach should be paid forty five thousand, like these professors are being paid exactly but it's not but anyway that's a you know we could probably talk about this go all day on long. and on and on yeah, all day long so anyway thank you guys so much for tuning in that's all we have for today's show Again, thank you to everybody for listening. Don't forget, sharing is caring. Once again, please follow us on social media. On Twitter, it's at Pilot Boys Pod. On Instagram and Facebook, it's Pilot Boys Podcast. And we'll post additional content there, and eventually we will do some giveaways. And always remember to be you. You is fly. Pilot Boys out. Where the Pilot Boys at? Pilot Boys, we get on up. Boys,